Good morning, church. And welcome to worship on this, the first Sunday after Easter. I am Pastor Daniel Gomez, Associate Pastor uh, here at Shepherd of the Hills Church. We are grateful that all of you have decided to come and worship here with us as well. If you are online, please know that today we will be sharing communion. So this might be a good time to go and get a piece of bread, a cracker, a tortilla, and something to drink so that you can also join us. Even though you are at the comfort of their home or wherever you may be, we would love for you to join us as we share communion this Sunday. And if this is your first or your second time with us, we're glad that you decided to come and check us out, given today that there are so many other options for you to go and visit. If you are here with us for the first or the second time, and you have not received a little gift that we have prepared for you, please, at the end of the worship service, uh, <clears throat> in the front doors, there's a welcome center. We would love for you to go and grab a little bag uh, for you that we have prepared as a thank you gift for you uh, deciding to visit us today. <clears throat> it is helpful for us if you would take the time and fill out your registration uh, of attendance card. Uh, if you are online or the connections card that came into your bulletin, you were given as you came in. There are boxes by the exits so that you can drop off these cards as well. And of course, our hope is that you have come into this place because you are coming with an expectation that your God is going to be here in this place. Perhaps you are at the peak of the mountain and you are soaring like an eagle. Good, great, we get to do that. Come and with an attitude of gratefulness unto the Lord, saying thank you for all that you've done in my life. Perhaps you're not exactly soaring like an eagle and maybe you're just running a step or two. Likewise, come knowing, trusting, and believing that God already knows you by name. And perhaps you're not soaring, you're not running. Maybe you're just walking one step at a time. Trust and know that God knows that you are here. And may God be the voice that will speak to your spirit. Encourage your soul. Amen. We begin every service by reminding ourselves what God thinks of us. So I invite you to remind yourself, I am chosen. I am, chosen. I am, blessed. I am blessed. I am loved. I am loved. Now stand as you are comfortable and smile at someone near you as you remind them, you are chosen. You are blessed. You are loved. Since you are already standing, please take a moment to greet those around you with a nod, elbow touch, or a handshake. And now I invite us to turn toward that camera over there so we can assure our online audience likewise. You are chosen. You are, chosen. You are blessed. You are, blessed. You, are loved. you are loved. Please be seated. And now, for our prelude, the shepherd's bells will bless us with a song.
Amen. Good morning. I am Bill Cutter, liturgist for today. Please rise as you are comfortable for the call to worship. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The Lord will wait patiently in their presence. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. God will give his power to the faint and strength to those without power. Help us walk. Help us run. Make us fly. Lord, we come to wait in your presence. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church. My name is Ken Goodenberger, and I'm the music director here at Shepherd of the Hills. This morning, we ask you to remain standing if you're comfortable doing so as we sing our opening hymn, Standing on the Promises. Assistant Minister of Care, please remain standing and join me in the opening prayer, which will be on the screen. O oh God, we are gathered here under the shelter of your wings, nurtured by your motherly love, and encouraged then to fly by faith on the wind of your spirit. You have spoken to us, saying, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Teach us how to wait then, that we may learn how to fly, and strengthen us with the assurance that we do not fly alone. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. The scripture lesson for today is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. It can be found in the Old Testament section of your pew Bible, 
on page 668 in the Old Testament. It'll also be on the screen. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, 
my rock and my redeemer. Imagine yourself in the setting of Isaiah chapter 40. You and other survivors of your people are in exile in Babylon, hundreds of miles away from home. The king is gone. Your temple is in ruins. Jerusalem's walls are destroyed and wild animals freely roam on the streets. Many family members and friends are dead or have gone missing. Everything you hold dear is uprooted. Where is your God? You thought that Yahweh, the God of your people and of your ancestors, seems that the gods of the mighty pagan foreign oppressor Babylon must have more power than perhaps him? Do other gods indeed control the natural world and the destiny of nations? You do remember the word of the prophets who warned that Yahweh would bring judgment for their repeated idolatries, immoralities, and injustices, and especially for neglecting to trust alone in Yahweh. But if your God has punished so harshly, does he care for you? Where is God in this God-forsaken land? You are grieving. You feel profoundly discouraged. You are weary and weak in body, mind, and spirit. As you anguish over these things with bitter tears and fears for yourself and for all of those you hold dear, then you hear the words of Yahweh through the prophet. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to them. Speak tenderly to their heart. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. For the exiles in captivity in Babylon, this was a painful reality. They were forced from their homes, scattered as the temple was laid to waste and became refugees from the very land that held promise. They were a people who longed for Jerusalem and wept by the rivers of Babylon. They are the faint and the powerless. And even observe their youth grow weary and fall exhausted. From this condition, the Israelites have reached a conclusion. Our way is hidden from the Lord. And our right is disregarded by our God. They could have concluded that the gods of Babylon were stronger than their God. Or that God really does not exist. But their conclusion is that they are simply disregarded, forgotten by their God. The Jews of Isaiah's time felt overlooked and cast aside by their God. The language of hiddenness is not just specific to Isaiah. It also appears in Psalms chapter 10, verse 11, which says, they think in their heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see us. When the writer says that God hides, he is saying that God's favor, delight, and smile are not felt in everyday life. This is an experience that people have throughout their lives when those moments of acute pain or the tremendous loss due to the loss of a loved one, etc., etc. These are the moments where that acute pain comes and it's felt, it's experienced, is visiting your life 
perhaps your household. And this is how the Israelites felt at this time. But for ancient Judah, the feeling was also corporate, dynamic, dramatic, and deeply diminishing. Having named this pain in verse 27 of Isaiah 40, the poem now shifts his attention to convince the audience of two things. God, the creator, is powerful, and there is a strange, mysterious power available to the weak, the weary, and to those who wait. Yes, God is powerful. Our creator is ever present. But the people of Israel at the time of Isaiah chapter 40 have come to a place in their lives, in their families, in their households, that they have now reached the conclusion that God is God, that Yahweh exists, but no more remembers them. The people, while in exile under Babylon, have come to a place where they have forgotten why they're there in the first place. Maybe 60, maybe 70 years ago is when it all started. God said to them time and time and time again, God would visit them through a prophet and remind them, encourage them, invite them not to continue in their ways of injustice, of immorality, and number one, their constant favor to go after other gods. God was the one that continued and continued to rescue them, but to no avail. Eventually, the consequences needed to come to pass. And now the people of Israel are in a place where they are saying, it is the reason why we are in this place is because our God has forgotten us. He no longer remembers us. What he does when we call out to him is that he hides his face so that he won't see us and he doesn't acknowledge, remember, or even bother to show up and meet our need. I'm not sure that we today, as Christians, as men and women that are on a spiritual journey, are really any different than that. We also, at times, will forget the promises that God has made. Perhaps we would forget that God did this and God did that for our lives years ago. I think that is perfectly human and natural for us, like the Israelites, to also forget. But let me highlight one approach about God, Yahweh. When he approached the Israelites, he did not come with a condemning, pointing finger. He came to offer them a response that will be better for their lives, but it requires for them to listen and to wait. The response probably of the voices of the Israelites would be, what do you think we've been doing? We've been waiting. No, I'm not talking about that kind of waiting. What I am not proposing, I believe God is sharing with the people of Israel, is a new approach about waiting. The Israelites felt justified by occupying the place where they were at, knowing and understanding that they were correct and that it was you, God, that failed us. You forgot about us. You hid your face and you never saw us. Hmm. Nevertheless, there's something real in the Christian walk. There is a Delay between God's commitments, between God's promises, and their realization. The author of Isaiah 40 recognizes this problem and draws on a response that should be recognizable to today's Christians. That we are people waiting in hope. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth 
will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. For Isaiah 40, there is a power at work in faithful waiting. However, waiting is not an easy thing. Not even at our stage or age in our lives. Especially for children such as four years old. Let's see. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two. Another, so then you'll have to. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> Waiting is hard for a four-year-old, but it's also hard for us. It's also hard because of our society today, that everything is fast, everything is quick. We want it spontaneously now. With my sons, when they were in junior high and one in high school, we would go to a drive-thru after soccer practice, what have you, go through a drive-thru, uh, go to a jack-in-the-box or supersonic, what have you. And they would always say, Dad, Dad, what are you doing? What are you doing? Don't park. Go through the drive-thru. I said, no, 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 no. no. We're going to get off. We're going to sit down and enjoy our meal. Besides, this is how we get to engage the people at the counter and what have you. Oh, Dad, just, just go through the drive-thru. Years later, no longer do we need to go through the drive-thru. 
they would say, Dad, just go. Park in this spot outside. They know we're coming. What do you mean? I haven't even ordered yet. Oh, took care of that already, Dad. I ordered it on the phone. Everything is fast. It's difficult waiting in our society today. But nevertheless, waiting has to do with faith. Waiting on the Lord is dependent upon our trust in our God. Waiting is part of our Christian walk, always. <clears throat> the word, the verb translated wait is based on a root meaning to twist, to stretch, to introduce tension. And the noun means line. By extension, the word came to mean both. Look eagerly for. Or lie in wait for. In other words, remain with expectation. In faith in Jesus Christ. To wait is to remain waiting in hope with expectation. Because it will come to pass. And then you have the other word. They shall renew their strength. Renew the word. Shalaf or kalaf. Actually means to change. Pass on. Away. Through. Succeed. Renew. When God is the one that is going to do the renew in our lives... We're going to pass. We're going to succeed. We're going to go through that waiting period in our lives. And renew also implies less the return of lost vigor and more the receipt of different divinely given vigor. Waiting really doesn't have to do with patience. Waiting in the Lord is more focused and dependent upon not patience, but your trust. You decide if you're going to wait on the Lord. You decide if you're going to trust on the Lord. Those children in the video, that was originated by behavioral psychologists from Stanford University. They followed most of those four-year-olds through high school and college, and even a few years later. And they discovered the following, that those that did not wait to eat their marshmallow grew up with a few more challenges in their decision-making. For instance, in high school or in college, uh, they needed to face many of the consequences for their poor decision-making that prompted them to waste time, not to be focused, and succeeding in their career or their educational goals was much, much more harder. Whereas those that waited, they found that their IQ was higher than the others, but that they were also more fruitful in their educational goals and that their decision making allowed them to continue to promote health and wealth in their lives. We struggle in our society with wanting things now because we have this thing of immediate gratification. We want it now. We can see it, we can taste it, is palpable and we want it, we desire it, because it's me that I'm taking care of. But maybe the lesson in this passage of scripture is that I'll take care of you, says God to the people of Israel, but with one condition. It is those who wait for the Lord who will do these things. Now, the rest of the passage of scripture says, and they shall renew their strength and they shall fly and soar like eagles and they shall run and not grow weary and they shall walk and not grow faint. 
in conclusion to this message. For me, I use this as a metaphor. And I have, I guess, experienced it in my journey of faith because I have been in all three. There were times when I was soaring like an eagle and everything was flowing and everything was going and everything was going my way. But then life happens to show up and I am an in introduced into a different season of life. And now I am not soaring, I am running. Fall, trip, get back up, continue to run. But sometimes we're not soaring, we're not running. Sometimes we're just barely walking. We're barely putting one foot in front of the other. And I'm speaking metaphorically in our journey of faith. We question, we're troubled with the faith journey. We ask, we are challenged by things. And yet, we just finished the sermon series of six weeks. And we just learned a little bit more about our God. That he is big enough and strong enough not to become easily upset because we question or because we doubt. We don't question that he exists. We just question why? Why? How come? How come? That's okay. Sometimes when you are in that season of life, walking, making it just one step in front of the other, just trust, remain, wait upon the Lord for eventually a new season will come and he will lift you up so that you can continue to grow wider and deeper in this, your journey of faith. Amen. Amen. And now join us in our song of response, hymn number 177. information about one of the ministries of the church so you know how and where your gifts are being used. Today we feature the ministry of our health education ministries led by Julie Killebrew. Julie was recently trained by Duet as a facilitator for a 10-week discussion series based on the groundbreaking book Loving Someone Who Has Dementia by Dr. Pauline Boss, PhD, a leading expert on caregiver grief. This 10-week series offers real help in dealing with the challenges, losses, and rewards of being a family caregiver of someone who is becoming psychologically absent. This series begins on Monday, April 15th at 2 p. 30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Our desire is to provide respite care for those who would otherwise be unable to attend because they have nowhere to leave their loved ones during this time. We need three to four individuals each week to keep these clients safe so their caregivers can attend the class. We are thankful to the Franklin Green Fund, which financially supports the Office of the Health Education Ministries, and to all of you for your gifts, which undergird this ministry and touch many lives here and beyond. 
Your special gifts this year to our mission's Easter offering will support the work of Duet throughout the greater Phoenix area and ensure these kinds of offerings continue not just here, but in any other places. The missions committee has chosen Duet to be the recipient of our Easter offering. The amount that you so willingly gave is... Your gifts may be placed in the offering boxes next to each door as you exit. Now please rise as you are comfortable and join me in this, our song of praise. comfortable and join me in prayer. God of power and patience, we gather in worship to wait on your presence and be filled by your power. Jesus healed with a touch and taught us that you are the source of the true healing that can make us whole. As we take time now in worship, to offer our gifts to you. We pray that they might be used to bring healing of body, of spirit, of broken relationships, healing of a world community that is deeply divided by distrust and self-interest. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Please be seated. If you are worshiping online, now is the time that you may want to go and gather the elements that you have uh, gathered, prepared for the sacrament. As we prepare to receive communion, please know that the communion table is open to all who wish to receive it. Everyone and anyone can come and participate of this communion table. This is the Lord's table. At the table of communion, we remember the last meal Jesus shared with his followers. It was a festive Passover meal, remembering all the ways God had sustained God's children and delivered them from bondage and slavery. At some point, Jesus transformed that meal forever, making it a remembrance that would touch hearts and lives for all the generations to come, reminding us of his presence among us. He took the bread they were sharing and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them as he said, this is my body given for you, reminding us of his presence and do, asking us to do this each time you, we drink it in remembrance of him. And so after the cup was over, he took, after the supper was over, he took the cup, blessed it and offered it to them saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this each time you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we remember. We remember Jesus' life lived in life, lived and loved. We remember how he allowed his life to be poured out for our sakes to set us free from sin and death. And as we remember, we are filled with love 
power, and hope, and we become able to offer ourselves back as a living sacrifice, to be united with this great sacrifice made on our behalf. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world as we pray in his name. Amen. And now we join in the prayer Jesus taught. assisting with the sacrament to come forward to the table. Worship host and those offering sanitizer also may take your place. You will be guided forward to receive the communion elements starting at the front of each section at the direction of our worship hosts. If for any reason you prefer <clears throat> to receive communion in your seat, we will move among you after all in each section have passed by. We will serve by intention. You will be offered hand sanitizer before you approach. The pastors will hand you the bread, and you will dip it into the cup, which is juice, so all can be included and consumed with grateful hearts. If you prefer a gluten-free option, the gluten-free station is here. If you prefer, we also have individually packaged elements in the basket at each station. The table is prepared.
give you thanks. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself so completely for us. Enable us to go out into the world in the strength of your steadfast spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Now please stand as you are comfortable for our closing hymn. Play praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Thank you very much for coming and joining us in this day in worship. Again, if you are visiting with us for the first or the second time, we would love for you to stop by at the Welcome Center outside in the patio, and we would love for you to take that as a gift from us to you. Two announcements. Uh, be sure, if you have the time, come back and join us this afternoon for the West Valley Wind Ensemble Concert at 3 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Invite your friends, bring your family. Admission is free. And also, uh, we, are co we have coordinated a, a, a tour um, at UMOM. Uh, uh, day Center in Phoenix, and that takes place on Thursday, April the 25th at 11 a.m. at UMOM. If you are wanting to join us and go visit UMOM, we are meeting in the patio area to carpool at 10 o'clock in the morning on Thursday, April 25. Please sign up. There's a clipboard uh, upon the entrance of the fellowship hall, and we only have room for 30 people. And plan to stay with us and join us for some lunch. They have a cafeteria where they are training some of these residents at UMOM to be, to be able to become gayfully employed in uh, different hotels and banquet departments and so on. So come if you want to experience um, that opportunity that we have as a missional outreach. Um, and also today, as they say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Regardless whether we're soaring with the eagles or whether we're running 
and tripping and getting back up or whether we're walking. We trust and we believe. And that's why we're going to remain and wait upon the Lord who will renew us. Amen? Amen. Have a blessed day. I'm deliberately lifting that so far as to drag that wire.